The photograph on your screen shows rescue boats jostling around the exposed stern section of HMS Thetis, a British submarine which had got into trouble during sea trials in the shallow coastal waters of the Irish Sea on June 1st, 1939. Of the 103 men on board, only four would escape. If, like me, you're wondering why all those men trapped were doomed to die when the stern section is clearly visible and accessible, then stay tuned for a tragic story of bad luck, poor judgement, delayed action, and what is possibly one of the Royal Navy's dirtiest little secrets. During the mid to late 1930s, as tensions with Nazi Germany were on the rise and a Second World War looked increasingly likely, the British Royal Navy, well aware of the threat posed by the superior German U-boats, were pushing hard to get the British sub fleet up to muster. Fifteen new submarines of the Triton, or T-Class, were commissioned in 1935 to replace the outdated OP and R-Class subs that the British had been using. The 270-foot-long HMS Thetis was the first T-Class to be built by the Camel Laird Company in Birkenhead. She was launched on the 29th of June 1938 and was dogged with bad luck right from the start. During a first set of sea trials in April 1939, it became apparent that a steering gear had been connected incorrectly, so that when steered to starboard, she actually turned to port, and vice versa. Also, when preparing for a first dive, the bow planes, which control the rate of the submarine's descent, became jammed solid in the hard dive position, and the trials had to be abandoned. One month later, her torpedo bay equipment was tested, and following this testing, the torpedo room gear was painted with a coating of enamel paint. Now it seems that the painter was either in a hurry or working sloppily as he painted a thick coat right over the torpedo tube doors. This is a small mistake, but one which was going to have huge ramifications later on. By the end of May, HMS Thetis was set for a second set of sea trials, and on the morning of June 1st, 1939, she left Birkenhead and headed out along the north coast of Wales to perform her first dive. On board were five officers, 48 crew, and a further 50 passengers. Most of these passengers, who were just along for the ride, were shipyard workers from Camel Laird, but there were also some Navy officers, dockyard managers, and even some of the caterers who were there to supply the sandwiches, beer, and pies for the reception after the sea trials were over. Sailing on ahead of the Thetis was the escort tug Griebcock, on standby in case of any emergency. By 1.30 in the afternoon, the Thetis was ready to commence her first dive. The escort tug had offered the opportunity for any of the passengers to get off before the diving test, but all 50 passengers had elected to remain on board. So at around 1.40, senior officer on board the Thetis, which was Lieutenant Commander Guy Bolas, sent a short message stating simply, diving now. However, the crew of the tug of the Griebcock saw that the Thetis was having trouble getting beneath the waves. For about an hour, the Thetis floundered around, circling and settling ever so slowly lower into the water. Just before 3pm, the crew on the tug heard a loud whoosh of air and watched as the Thetis quickly disappeared beneath the surface. The commander of the tug, Lieutenant Coulter, wasn't happy with what he'd seen. The Thetis was supposed to settle at periscope depth then submerge and release smoke flares. None of that had happened. The Thetis had simply disappeared beneath the waves. So Coltar decided to send a message through to Admiralty HQ in Gosport, but owing to the short range of the ship-to-shore radio, his message couldn't be sent directly, but instead had to be relayed via the local telegraph office. Unfortunately, the boy whose job it was to take messages from the harbour through to the telegraph office on his bicycle suffered a flat tyre on the bike, and had to spend about an hour repairing the puncture. By the time the HQ in Gosport received the message about the Thetis, it was already 6.15pm. Meanwhile, for some reason having failed to drop anchor, the escort tug had unknowingly drifted some four miles distant from the actual position of the Thetis. Navy officers in the Gosport HQ were already worried, having had no direct contact with the Thetis for over three hours, and so, upon the receipt of the worrying message from the escort tug, a search of the immediate area was ordered. The Royal Navy destroyer HMS Brazen, already close by in the Irish Sea, was dispatched to help locate the Thetis, but she began searching in the area where she found the escort tug, 
which was some four miles away from the actual position of the stricken sob. So what had gone so horribly wrong on board the Thetis? Well, upon commencing the diving test, Commander Bolas had discovered that the bow of the submarine seemed too light, and that all efforts to dive were proving fruitless. On the trip out from Birkenhead, Bolas had remarked that the Thetis was riding high in the water, and was heeled over slightly to port. The submarine's trim seemed off, so Bolas ordered that number 5 and number 6 torpedo tubes should be checked to see if they were indeed flooded, to act as ballast. As if not, this would possibly account for the extra buoyancy at the bow. The way to check these tubes was to open a very small stopcock in the torpedo tube door, and if any water came out, then you knew the tube was flooded. Now, remember the overzealous painter who covered everything in the torpedo room in thick paint? Well, he had inadvertently blocked the tiny inspection tube. When torpedo officer Fred Woods opened the test cock, only a drip of water came out. Taking this as proof that the tube was most likely empty, Woods decided to open the inner hatch to inspect the tube. Unaware that a fatal mistake had been made. The outer torpedo tube door was in fact wide open, and the tube was fully flooded. Upon releasing the catch on the inner door of torpedo tube 5, the door immediately flew open, and hundreds of gallons of seawater began flooding the torpedo compartment. Woods and another man tried in vain to close it, but the pressure of the rushing seawater prevented them. The sudden weight of the water rushing in, combined with the bow planes being set for hard dive, caused the Thetis to pitch forward sharply, and she began sinking almost immediately. The men quickly decided to abandon the torpedo room, but a bent butterfly latch made it impossible for Woods to close the watertight door behind him. This resulted in two forward compartments being flooded before they were sealed off. The Thetis, now weighed down with tons of seawater in the bow, sank straight down 150 feet to the seabed. The bow ploughed into the muddy bottom, bringing the sub to a juddering halt. All attempts to free the vessel by running the engines full astern were in vain. The submarine was crippled, stuck 150 foot down on the seabed. Now the Thetis was carrying enough air to be submerged for around 36 hours, but with the extra 50 passengers on board, this time was cut in half. The men kept calm, chatting about sport and what kind of reception they would get after they were rescued, but as the hours passed by with no signs of rescue from the surface, Commander Bolas began to worry about the dwindling air supply. The crew hit upon a plan to help the rescuers above, and by dumping most of the drinking water from the stern tanks, they could make the rear end of the Thetis buoyant enough to rise to the surface. After all, the submarine was 270 feet long, and they were in only 150 foot of water. Now the plan worked, and the stern section of the Thetis broke the surface, rising well out of the water, and plainly visible to anyone nearby. Unfortunately, as the rescue vessels were looking in the wrong area, darkness fell before anyone caught sight of the stern of the submarine, and the Thetis remained undiscovered overnight. As time passed with no sounds from above, Bolas next asked for volunteers to begin the perilous task of evacuating the ship through the aft escape hatch. The crew had Davis escape gear, but few had been fully trained in how to use it, and of course most of the 50 passengers on board would have no clue on how to escape a sunken submarine. First up to volunteer was Captain Harry Oram, senior fleet officer. Now, at first sight, you might think that this is just a case of some top brass wanting to get his backside off the ship before everybody else, but in fact, it was a very much a selfless act. Firstly, to get off the boat through the escape hatch, you had to flood it while inside to equalise the pressure before you could open the outer hatch. With the sub tilted on such a steep angle, there was no guarantee that the outer hatch would even open properly, and the trapped occupant might drown in the airlock. Also, even if a man did manage to get out, it was likely that there would only be an empty sea above to greet him, and the likelihood was that he would drown before being rescued. Because of this, Captain Oram had messages taped to his clothing, outlining the situation on board and the necessity of getting fresh air into the vessel. If his body was found, it could then still help the remaining men. Captain Oram and Torpedo Officer Woods went first, successfully making the 20-foot ascent to the surface. 
By around 7 o'clock the following morning, lookouts on the brazen had finally caught sight of the stern of the Thetis sticking up out of the water and the two men floating nearby. The men were quickly rescued and the first real news of what was going on had reached the surface. Vessels were soon on scene, swarming around the exposed stern. Steel hawsers were fixed around the stern and a diver was sent down to try and connect an air hose. Unfortunately, the diver only had 30 minutes of air and failed to connect the hose in time. Meanwhile, sailors milled around the exposed stern in lifeboats as the hours dragged on and on. On board the Thetis, conditions were becoming unbearable as the carbon dioxide built up and the oxygen had begun to run out. Bolas had ordered the men to try and escape four at a time through the escape hatch. It was a desperate plan to try and get at least some of the men off the Thetis and make the remaining oxygen spin out a bit longer, but it ended in disaster. One man panicked as the chamber was being filled, tearing out his own breather and jamming the outer hatch as he tried to open it prematurely. The crew then opened the inner hatch and dragged the four men back inside, but three were already drowned. The survivor stated that the outer hatch was now jammed and further escape was impossible, but two other men decided to give it a go anyway. Shipbuilder Frank Shaw and stoker Mac Arnold, by working together, got the jammed hatch open and they too made it to the surface, where they were picked up by the waiting boats. By now, many of the men on the Thetis were either already passed out or dizzy and uncoordinated from the lack of oxygen. They were in no fit condition to perform even simple tasks, never mind organising a risky escape from a crippled sob. We will never know for sure exactly what happened, but something went wrong during the next attempt to use the emergency escape hatch, and it resulted in the sudden and complete flooding of the Thetis. As tons of seawater filled the submarine, the steel hawsers snapped under the strain and the Thetis sank back down to the seabed. At just after midnight on June the 3rd, the news was broken to the anxious relatives waiting on shore. The official statement was, There is no hope for the remaining men in the submarine. It wasn't long before grief turned to anger. Why had it taken so long to find the sob? Why wasn't the exposed stern made secure with extra hawsers? Why were the other Navy divers left stranded on a platform in Scotland waiting for a boat instead of being flown to the scene? And most of all, why had nobody cut a hole in the exposed stern? The steel plating was only five-eighths of an inch thick and salvage vessels with cutting gear were there on site, but apparently they'd all been told to stand down and wait. The findings of the official inquiry did little to dispel the idea that the whole thing was a whitewash a cover-up of the failure by the Admiralty to act sooner. For example, one of the findings by the inquiry was that the deaths of the 99 men was mainly due to, I quote, the failure of those inside to escape. Now call me cynical, but that's on a par with blaming a shooting victim for not dodging the bullet. And by declaring that there was no party with any culpability, the inquiry effectively denied the grieving families any chance of compensation. Worse still, a recently unearthed memo found in the National Archives points to a deliberate decision being made by the Admiralty not to cut into the stern of the submarine. With war looming, it seems that all efforts were made to preserve the structural integrity of the vessel so that she could be reused, even if that meant sacrificing the lives of the men on board. The facts do seem to support this macabre theory, after all, the Thetis was salvaged from the seabed and refitted for active duty. She was renamed as the HMS Thunderbolt and saw much action during World War II before finally being sunk by depth charges. She lies today somewhere on the floor of the Mediterranean Sea at around 4,500 feet down. The remains of her second crew are still on board. As for the original 99 men who perished... Their remains were removed from the Thetis when she was salvaged, and they are buried in a mass grave in Hollyhead Cemetery. A memorial to those lost stands there to this day, but one has to wonder, would any memorial actually be necessary if the men in power had decided to rescue the trapped crew instead of deciding to salvage a submarine just to save some time and some money? <laughs>